All right. Uh, once again, we should emphasize what it means for the group operation to be well defined. You really want to get this, okay? This is something I can very well test you on, quiz you on. You understand what it means for the group operation to be well defined in the factor. It's again because a given code set can have more than one representative, more than one element that goes in front of it, yet still be the same left code set. So if we assume A, H, and A prime H are the same, and assume B, H, and B prime are the same, then the product we get with coset multiplication, thinking of the cosets with A and B as representatives, we get this. Thinking of the cosets with A prime and B prime being representatives, we get this. Are these two cosets the same thing? They better be. Otherwise, the operation doesn't make sense. Okay. That's the point, and I gave you the book's argument, and I hinted at an other argument you should consider checking on your own as well. Once you verify that the group operation is well defined, the rest is actually fairly easy, based on what we already know. We can confirm that EH is the identity element of the factor group, and that's just going to be by definition of coset multiplication. Given any left coset, any element of the factor group, I multiply it by this element. I did it on the right here, but I could have done it on the left. You get back to what you started with. EH is the identity element. Confirm that AH has an inverse for any A, and you could hopefully guess what the inverse would be. I didn't write it down. It should be that. And you can confirm this, and then we have the sucking. It's sucked into H because E is in H. So you can write this kind of equation. The inverse of AH is A inverse H. Technically speaking, you should verify associativity as well. Usually I say you don't have to verify associativity. It really does work, though. Uh, if you wrote, say, this, Simplified. And put parentheses in the way that I'm doing for extra emphasis. And then use the associative property in the group G itself. I'm probably showing more here than I need to. Oops. That's, okay, yeah, I should. I'm probably showing more parentheses than I need to. There is a kind of tedious verification of the associated property. You got to think about each step, but it is. Valid. Probably if I test you on this, the test would be on verifying it's well defined. That's the most difficult and in, but interesting part of the proof as well. And it really tests you understand properties of cosets and also what it means to be normal, for H to be normal. Here are a couple applications of fact groups, really, within group theory itself, to the study of groups. There's something called the GZ theorem that says if G is a group and the factor group of G by its center is cyclic, then G must, in fact, be abelian. This is kind of a strange little theorem. Because if G is abelian then, I guess that would mean the center is actually all of G, and this would be actually trivial. You could continue the implications here. So again, what I just said there is if this factor group happens to be cyclic, then G would be abelian, 
which would mean its center is, the center of G is all G itself. It's not a proper subgroup. Which would mean this factor group is actually trivial. If the factor group is cyclic, it must be trivial. Kind of a weird thing. How do I say that? And therefore, if this is not a trivial group, it cannot be cyclic. Um, as an example of an application of that, that statement there, I could consider, let's see here, um, G being D6, symmetries over regular hexagon, rotations and reflections, and its center. And back in chapter 3, it was shown that the center of dihedral groups, where this is an even number, consists of the identity and R180. back in chapter 3. Now if that was an odd number, then it's just the identity. But if it's an even number, symmetries of squares, hectagons, octagons, for example, then R180 is in the group and it is in the center. G has got 12 elements, the center has got 2 elements, the factor group therefore has how many? And I can form the factor group because the center is always normal. I have six. So this factor group is not trivial. By this fact here, it cannot be cyclic. It can't be isomorphic to Z6. So what would it be isomorphic to? Up to isomorphism, there are only two groups of order six. Z6 and D3, which by the way is isomorphic to S3. This can't be cyclic, though, by this fact on the screen. Therefore, it must be isomorphic to D3. Okay? An interesting little application of this fact. You could also say, uh, as another example of an application of this, if G happens to be a non-abelian group whose order is the product of two distinct primes, P and Q, then the center must be trivial. Why would that, why would that be the case? Well, argued by contradiction, if ZG is not trivial, since G is not abelian, it doesn't equal G itself, it must be a, a proper non-trivial subgroup of G. Its order must be P or Q by Lagrange's theorem. The order of G is P times Q. But that would imply that the factor group has order either PQ divided by P or PQ divided by Q, which would be Q or P. But we know groups of prime order are cyclic. That would then be a contradiction. Because 
because if the factor group of G by the center is, is uh, cyclic, it must be trivial. And this would say it's a non-trivial cyclic. Another fact that's mentioned that's possibly useful is that this factor group is in fact isomorphic to the group of inner automorphisms. Which would also say, if you think about it, the group of inner automorphisms um, of G cannot be cyclic unless it's trivial as well. because they're isomorphic. The only way this can be cyclic is if it's trivial. Therefore, the only way this can be cyclic is if it's trivial. If you have a non-identity interautomorphism, then um, you know it can't be a generator of the group of interautomorphisms because there would not be a cyclic. What are inner automorphisms again? Those are automorphisms defined by this formula here. Those are the inner automorphisms. I didn't want to take the time to outline the proofs of these things. I think I'm going to go on to the next slide. If we have time at the end, we'll come back to this and outline the proofs. Another application is something called Cauchy's theorem for abelian groups. It's a partial converse of Lagrange's theorem. A more general con uh, converse that I mentioned a couple lectures ago was one of the Silo theorems, the first Silo theorem. This is a special case of that, really. G is assumed to be a finite abelian group, for one thing, and with the first Silo theorem, G is not assumed to be abelian. P is a prime that divides the order of G. In the first Silo theorem, we assume P to the K power divided the order of G. Cauchy's theorem for abelian group says then that G has an element of order P, and therefore also a subgroup of order P. Whereas with that first Silo theorem, it said there was a subgroup of order P to the K. So that first Silo theorem is more general than this one. This is a special kind of theorem. They put it in this section, the author put it in this section because you can prove it using factor groups. And what we, the tools we have so far, whereas with the first CELO theorem, we need more advanced tools. So anytime you have a finite abelian group and you've got a prime that divides the order, there will be at least one element of order, that order. And again, the first theo of Silo theorem generalizes that even if G is not abelian, and even if we had a power of the prime that was second power, third power, or fourth power dividing the order of the group, you'd still have an L, a subgroup of the given order, P, P squared, P cubed, assuming all those things divided the order of G. Okay? You, sh you should study the proof of this. It's a pretty interesting proof. And the author emphasizes the proof uses factor groups, and it also uses induction. And the author comments how combining factor groups with induction is a super powerful technique for proofs in um, algebraic structures. It's a super powerful technique to combine those things. Because 
What's, what's the idea of factor groups? Why do we consider them, besides being maybe a curiosity? Is in general, at least if H is not the trivial subgroup, this is, well, it's got a lower order than G does. And therefore might be a simpler group to analyze. Might be easier to figure out the isomorphism class for this group than G itself. But they should be related to each other as well. That's the overarching thing that we're after with factor groups, is they can tell us information about the group itself. And the fact that this is smaller when this is true implies you can use induction oftentimes to do proofs, combining that with factor groups, like with this theorem. For the rest of the time today, unless we have a little bit of time at the end to outline those proofs, which we probably won't, we're going to talk about the last topic of Chapter 9, internal direct products. You knew if we had an external direct product, there must be an internal direct product. Right? It sort of implies that there must be, just by the name. We say that G, a group, is an internal direct product of two subgroups, H and K. And we write G equals H cross K, which was consistent with the notation that I learned for external direct products, but not the notation that our book uses for external direct products, the plus with a circle around it. But the book does write H cross K with internal direct products. Careful, though, in this context, this is not the same as a Cartesian product. So the, the elements here are not ordered pairs. They are elements of G. This is just notation to emphasize some facts. First of all, it emphasizes that H and K are normal in G. G equals HK, meaning every element in G is an element of H times an element of, element of K. This notation, HK, that's the set of all Things can, that can be formed by multiplying something in H by something in K. With a thing in H on the left and a thing in K on the right. Every element of G is a product like that. Moreover, the intersection of H and K is trivial, meaning it's the identity. Meaning that, not the empty set, the identity. <coughs> they are subgroups after all. Here's a, a consequence of this that does require proof. I'm not proving it. Every element of capital G can be represented not just as a product like this, but in a unique way. The fact that H and K are normal, and the fact that the intersection of H and K is trivial, can be used to prove this consequence, not just that this product is true, which would follow from this fact, some a, little h and some little k, but also that it's unique. There's a unique element from capital H and a unique element from capital K where little g equals little h times little k. This has a linear algebra analog. This is analogous to a set of two linearly independent vectors being a basis for a three-dimensional vector space. Now, if you remember, when you had a two-dimensional vector space, it's going to have a basis with two vectors in it. And you may remember from linear algebra, I hope you would remember, that for any vector in that vector space, it can be written in a unique way as a linear combination of the basis vectors. So with the linear algebra notation that you may have used, if V is a vector space, first of all, spanned by V1 and V2, restricting myself to two vectors here since I'm restricting myself to two subgroups here. And B1 and B2 are linearly independent. So the spanning condition is similar to this condition, except span means to take, take a linear combination. It doesn't mean multiply two elements. The fact that this set is linearly independent 
is analogous to the intersection of these two things being trivial. And in fact, if you've got two vectors that are linearly independent, they're not multiples of each other. And so the subspace of V that they span, if V, for example, is uh, say R3, is going to be a plane. Well, the subspace that each individual vector spans will be a line through the origin. The subspace that they span together, V itself, is going to be a plane through the origin. But the intersection of these two lines is just the zero vector, analogous to E. The intersection is trivial. And in this situation, given V in capital V, there exists unique scalars K1 and K2 such that V equals K1 B1 plus K2 B2. So there's the, the vector space analogy here for what's going on with the internal direct products. It's not the exact same concepts, but it's similar. And it's got a similar kind of importance. It also turns out that if G is the internal direct product of H and K, then G is actually isomorphic to the exter external direct product of H and K, whose elements are ordered pairs. When I write this, at least in our book's notation, this is not taken to be a Cartesian product. This is not taken to be a set of ordered pairs in our textbook. We're saying G is this, it just means these things. It means H and K are normal. It means every element of capital G is a product of something H with something K. It means the intersection of H and K is trivial, just the identity. But if those facts hold, then it turns out that G is isomorphic to this external direct product. The elements of this are ordered pairs. Ordered pairs of this form where little h is in capital H and little k is in capital K. What would the isomorphism be? Given little g and capital G, what do I map it to in the external direct product of, of H with K? Well, this uniqueness and this fact here is important to defining the mapping. The fact that capital G is the external direct product of H and K means there exists unique little h and capital H and little k in capital A such that G equals little h times little k. Therefore, for that little h and that little k, you'd map this to this. And it would be a, a well-defined mapping because of the uniqueness. Say that again. If capital G is this, extra, this internal direct product, and little g is an element of capital G, what will the isomorphism that you want to define map little g to? Because of this fact, you can say there exists unique little h and little k, so this is true, and therefore you would map this to that ordered pair, and that would be your isomorphism. Though, of course, you'd have to verify it's an isomorphism. External direct products take two possibly unrelated groups and creates a new group whose elements are ordered pairs and whose operation is done component-wise. We saw even that the, the operation in the first component could be addition and the operation in the second component could be multiplication. Internal direct products take a group G and take subgroups H and K with these properties. H and K are related, they're the subgroups of the same group. But these are isomorphic, so these ideas are related. And possibly, then, could be useful in figuring out the, the isomorphism class of G. If you know G is isomorphic to this, where you, can, you have to figure out what H and K are, then if you can figure out the isomorphism class of this, you've figured out the isomorphism, isomorphism class of G. I 
so this can be a useful thing. Not going to have time for an example. Let me just mention another classification fact. And here we have a situation where uh, the PC did not render my symbols appropriately. So I'm going to have to write the symbols on the board. Remember, we're mathematical taxonomists. We want to classify things in group theory. Let P be a prime and let G be a group of order P squared. So for example, this could be a group of order 4 or 9 or 25 or 49 or 121, 11 squared. Then G is either isomorphic to Z P squared or the external direct product of Z P with itself. It's either cyclic or isomorphic to the external direct product of two cyclic groups of prime order. And therefore, it may not be cyclic, but it's at least abelian. If P is prime and G has order P squared, then G is abelian. So again, or groups of order 4, 9, you know, 4 being 2 squared, 9 equaling 3 squared, 25 equaling 5 squared, 49 equaling 7 squared, 121 equaling 11 squared, etc. Groups of order the square of a prime are either cyclic or the external direct product of two cyclic groups. A group of order 49 is either isomorphic to Z49 or the external direct product of Z7 with itself. And these are not isomorphic to each other. The 7 is not relatively prime to itself. Make sure you study the proofs of the GZ theorem, the fact that G mod the center is isomorphic to the group of inner automorphisms, and Cauchy's theorem for finite abelian groups. Make sure you study those proofs. I like those proofs a lot. And even though you may not prove the entire thing on the exam, I might have you prove a part of it. Or the fact, for example, that we saw today that the coset operation was well defined. Those are all proofs you should definitely study. So again, I'm going to make another video about 50 minutes long or so tomorrow, getting into chapter 10. And then we have class again one week from today on Wednesday. They'll continue talking about chapter 10 and we will review the exam. Exam Friday of next week, nine days from the left. See you then. See you Wednesday.